Good morning, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday. Let's stand together. Don't be afraid to wave those things around as we worship together. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Oh, see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. No, oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Faithful forevermore, you have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen, you will do great things, and God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great Give him praise. Give him praise. Good morning, church. Good morning. How are you? Doing okay? So good to see you. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Thanks for those joining us online. Hey, happy Palm Sunday. Okay, there's some palm branches around. It's not like just, that's like a thing we always do, you know. It's a special Sunday, okay? So, hey, turn and greet somebody. Ask them how they're doing. So good to be with you all.
Let's continue to worship together. Even though I walk, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I You guys can have a seat this morning. Father God, we praise your name this morning. We're so grateful that in times of wilderness, in times when we're in the wasteland, that you provide a safe place for us, a place that we can come to heal and come to rest and be in your presence. We give you honor and praise this morning. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the 
Church, pray with me. Almighty God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for being our mighty fortress. And we want to lean into that. Would your peace just surround all of us here and those joining us online today? God, no matter where we're at, whether we're on the highest of mountain on Palm Sunday or maybe we've had a tough week, would you draw near? to all of us, and would we feel your overwhelming peace and love for your children today, God? God, thank you for the service. We're excited. Palm Sunday, your triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and days later you would go to the cross, die for all of us. But that wasn't the end of the story. The resurrection happened. And we're going to celebrate that next week, but we look forward to that, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, Church, so good to be with you. My name's Colton. If you don't know me, um, please come talk to me after service because I want to get to know you. All right. Here's our Right Now page if you need to know that. And I think, is there some kiddos in the back? Yes, there is. Okay, we have a thing that we do at Montrose Church on Palm Sunday, the kiddos go through the aisles, waving the palm branches. And so, hey, this is the time to get out the cameras. This is the time to cheer on the kids and celebrate them and love on them. Are we ready for that? Yes. Okay. Are we waiting on the kids? Do I need to stall? I do need to stall. (laughs) 
Here we go. Declan leading it off. Come on, buddy. Come on, Macho Church. I know you got more than that. Come on. So much fun, so much fun. See you guys, we love you kids. Parents, did you get your photos? No, there was little palm branches in the way, I couldn't get them. All right, church, a few announcements, a few announcements. Maundy Thursday is a special service we have at Montrose Church. It's this Thursday, and Dave will be leading that. And we have two services, six, to seven, six and seven p.m this Thursday for Maundy Thursday. These kids are trying to stay. They're like, let us stay, come on. We want to hang out with the big kids. Okay, so Maundy Thursday. Everybody got that? This Thursday, 6 and 7 p.m., choose a service. That'll be a wonderful and powerful service that Pastor Dave will lead. Next week, Easter Sunday, and you can find all this on our Right Now page as well. Um, but we're having a 6.30 sunrise service out in the back lot. So for you early birds, that'll be a really cool service, acoustic, out in the parking lot. And then um, 9 o'clock we'll be live at Pasadena, and then we'll have 10 live here and 11.30 live here as well. And there will be kids stuff um, for every service, for every service. What else? Also, Pastor Dave is starting a new series next week, Back to Life. Uh, that's what it's called. This will be the conclusion of our Rivers in the Wilderness series, which I hope you guys have enjoyed. It's been a really great series. And so Dave will be concluding that today with the sermon, Victory in the Wilderness. So that'll be great. That'll be great. All right, I think we have a little video that's just going to help you uh, with the Easter stuff as well. Check this out. Hello, and welcome to Montrose Church. You are about to embark on an exhilarating experience of in-person service complete with live music, a sermon from Pastor Dave, and interacting with other humans. While we understand that it may have been a while since you have engaged in gathering in this space, we thought we would take a few moments to provide you with some tips to make your re-entry to live services as seamless as possible. First, we understand that you've been watching service from the comfort of your own home, but as you come back to church, pajamas are not acceptable attire. Please choose some different clothes. Next, coffee and donuts are back. But remember, this is a communal activity, so you don't need to touch or taste one to find out which one you like. Make a decision and move along. Next, we know that you've been watching services on your own time when it's been convenient for you. But our live services have a schedule, so please check the times and locations for each of our Easter services. Next, participation. Remember, you're no longer just staring at a screen. We can see you. So, practice a hearty amen. Sing out loud. Also, smile. It creates warmth and connection. And finally, you're gonna need one of these. It's a name tag, 
so you're not caught in that awkward position of saying, hey buddy, we hope this will provide a safe and fulfilling experience as you come back to church. Very nice, very nice. All right, let me pray for our tithes and offerings, and then we'll keep it going here. Gracious God, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the sacrificial giving of your people. And may all the gifts go to the furthering of your kingdom. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I'm the first one in line to die when the cavalry comes. It feels like the great divide. It's already come Yeah, I'm wasting my way through days Losing youth along the way Oh, if God is on my side Oh, if God is on my side Oh, if God it's on my side who can be against me it was a greenness i feel for a while somehow it changed some kind of blindness i used to protect me from all of my stain Yeah, I wish this was vertigo Just feels like I'm falling slow Oh, if God is on my side Oh, if God is on my side Oh, if God is on my side like mine yeah, it's wrong when it feels like work to belong all I feel is hurt oh if God is on my side oh if God is on my side oh if God is on my side then who can be against me?
Yes. How are you? <laughs> Happy Palm Sunday. So uh, I want you to use this word this morning, but maybe through the week. Meanwhile, you can say that, meanwhile. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So I think it means we're going to have trouble. It's going to be a part of it. And I think people who follow Jesus Christ have trouble. And I think people who do not follow Jesus Christ have trouble. But I think people who follow Jesus Christ can say, meanwhile, because there's some other things going on in the story and in the journey. It's not just what we see. It's not just what's immediately in front of us. And we know that because we're people of great depth and maturity. few years ago, uh, I always say, you know, I, I, I wasn't a great, in my younger years, at planning ahead and thinking through processes. And so uh, I got out of college, and I had, a, I had an offer in that spring semester leading up to graduation, a job offer, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go make some money. <laughs> uh, I was going to pull down like a 1000 a month. <laughs> yeah, sweet. So uh, newly married, I took a job in Dallas as a staff person at a church. I was the pastor of youth and children and uh, went there. And in our time there, the next three and a half years, we had our first child and then realized I'm probably going to need to go back to grad school. It's good planning. It's good planning. So we packed up and we headed off to grad school And so now with a kid, you know, that makes grad school much more complicated. There's more expenses involved. There's, you know, timing issues. There's all that stuff that's going on. So we decided we'll get through seminary as fast as we can. We'll go on the, what's the quickest way you can complete the program. And so from start to finish, it was two years and nine months. And that's pretty fast. So I, 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 and the way you do that is you, you go to every interim and you go to every summer session. You don't ever stop going to school. You just start and you just go. I think I was off four weeks in my career as a student in grad school. And so when you're in that mode, you start to look for shortcuts. You start to look to things, you know, that can help you out. And I noticed one spring as I was planning for the summer sessions that there was something in the catalog called Summer Camping Ministries for Youth. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sweet spot. (laughs) So I read the description. It turns out that this whole class was a week of backpacking in the Rocky Mountains. And I'm like, that is quality graduate education right there. (laughs) Now, I had to read some books and write some papers, but, but the heart of the class was, you know, loading up a backpack and heading off. And we we went to Collegiate Peaks, the Collegiate Peaks area of the Rocky Mountains. If you know the area, then you know that's some of the highest peaks in the Rockies. You know, Mount Harvard's over 14,000 feet. That, that takes you up over the Continental Divide. Awesome. Awesome. And in my brain, I was going to walk among the mountains for a week, enjoying nature, relaxing, unwinding. I had not yet realized how difficult this process was going to be. We arrived at the trailhead. I had a backpack that weighed about 40 pounds. And I realized pretty quickly that there was very little oxygen here at the trailhead. We hadn't really acclimated from Kansas. I don't know if you know Kansas, but Kansas is not, it has zero elevation, zero. So just to drive up, I was winded. (laughs) And then, you know, day one, your goal is to get way up the mountain. I mean, it's you're going up all day. So I strapped on the backpack and I started walking. 
It wasn't very long before I was making deals with myself. You understand? Just 10 steps. Just take 10 steps and catch your breath. Just 10. You can do 10. Now, one of the cruelest things known to human beings is something that they do on mountains like that, on trails like that. They're called switchbacks. <laughs> so you can walk for many of those 10-step segments and look and go, I, I, I'm making zero progress here. <laughs> I've come up the mountain 10 feet, but I've walked a mile and a half. So us brainy people said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to start cutting off the ends of those switchbacks. We just ain't going all the way down there and turning around and coming back. We're not doing it. I'm tired of looking at these people anyway. <laughs> and so we did. Those of us at the back of the line, we just started taking shortcuts. <laughs> And as we rounded one of those corners, there was our guide standing there. And he says, uh, what, what exactly do you fellas think you're doing? Well, we're trying to survive. That's our overall plan <laughs> right now. We want to be where you are when you pitch the tents. That's our goal right now. And he said, listen, I don't think you understand. You're not allowed to cut the corners on those switchbacks. This is nature. And we're preserving nature. You're not making your own trail. And if you do it again... I'm going to make you go back down the mountain and fix it. Well, we had no interest in that. <laughs> so we stopped taking the shortcuts. And I think sometimes when I think about what life is like, it feels like that. It feels like I'm just going to go. I mean, I thought when I started, I was just going to walk through life and just be like, oh, isn't it lovely? Isn't it pretty? But we all go through times in our lives when we go just... Just one more step, just two more steps, just three more, just five more, just a few more, and I'll stop and catch my breath. And somewhere along the way, it occurs to us that maybe there are some shortcuts we can take. And those don't always work out very well for us. They tend to mess up more than they fix. So I want you to kind of keep that in your mind, that image in your mind, and I want you to say to yourself, meanwhile, <laughs> because we need to keep this in our the forefront of our thinking. So we're coming down to the end of this series on wilderness, and we're talking today about victory in the wilderness and what that looks like. And so just to make everybody mad, I want to read from the book of James. <laughs> James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you are so hypocritical. <laughs> because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I'm not doing that. I'm not counting it pure joy when I go through trials of every kind. Count it pure joy. And, and for a long time, I just haven't really liked this verse because I don't really get it. Like, I'm like, really? I mean, I could say I'm having pure joy, but I'm not. I'm ticked off a little. Just me? Listen, if you're not coming on the journey with me, I, you know, I already know all this about myself. <laughs> and I've started to read this passage in a little different way because I think it's what James is saying. I think James is saying, I want to invite you to a way of living and a way of thinking that is not like everyone else. What I want you to see is in life there are troubles. In life there are troubles. When Jesus looks at us and says, in this world you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He's acknowledging and saying right up front, there's going to be stuff, but there's more going on. There's going to be a lot of things. Meanwhile, some other things are going on. And I think when we stop and we start to think about that, I think James is saying, you can look at life like it's mistreating you. You can look at life like it's unfair. We can look at life like, you know, poor me, I, I can't believe this is happening. And I often do. It's kind of the default setting. Or, James says, I want to invite you to a space in which you think about this. God does not waste one moment of your grief. Not one moment of your struggle. Not one moment... He, he will use it. 
And what he will use it for is to create perseverance. And I don't know about you, but that's overrated to me. I mean, I'd, I'd be like, well, can you give me perseverance without hurting me? You know? But the perseverance, when it is finished, produces maturity and completeness. And I am interested in maturity and completeness. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is full of crazy people. Amen? Amen. I mean, none of us here, but. <laughs> and so what is the remedy for all of that? Isn't it completeness and maturity? Isn't it growing into something? And I think James is just saying, listen, you, you, gotta, you can look at life in one of two ways. And now with that said, you know, I think James is talking about some kinds of problems that are your everyday garden variety kind of stuff that we all go through. And then there's another layer of stuff that's life altering grief. We're going to get to both of them. There's that everyday kind of stuff. And, you know, when you go through life-altering grief, guess what? All this other stuff, you go, <laughs> give me that all day. I don't want this. But Jesus is walking this journey. He's walking this journey, and he's inviting you and I to a victory in the wilderness. And sometimes the wilderness looks like these everyday kind of temptations, and sometimes the wilderness looks like these life-altering situations but he invites us to victory and all of that and in all of it I think somewhere along the way we have to say meanwhile meanwhile I don't know if you ever think about this but I think about my ancestors who are pioneers do you ever you know think about who they were and how they lived and what it was that got them up in the morning and allowed them to function in the way they function do you think about that I mean, I think about if I had to get up in the morning and go, you know, down to the creek to draw water. I resent having to walk from the bed to the shower. <laughs> you understand? I mean, it takes it's just like. Uh, first thing in the morning, sun comes up. You go down to draw water and you bring it back. And then you got to build a fire in the oven. There's no freezer. You can't pull out a frozen breakfast sandwich and pop it in a microwave, which is a lot, right? I don't have two minutes to let this thing warm up in the microwave. What am I? And every bit of morsel of food you put in your mouth, you have to, you have to make it, cook it. And heaven forbid, you have to grow it before you cook it or raise it. And then you have to prepare. I, I just don't understand. I just wonder what all of us would do if we were dropped down into that situation. And it causes me to wonder, you know, what kind of stamina do I really have? How do I really see life? What is the context? How does God look at us and go, oh, man, these other people had it hard. These people have it easy. These people hardly complained at all. These people complain all the time. <laughs> Where is my resilience? Where's my trust that there really is victory in the wilderness, that this is not meaningless or purposeless? And where is this invitation for me to walk this journey in a powerful way? I think Jesus gives us some great insights into both of these areas that we walk in our lives. Listen to what happens in Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, he, he said, Throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him. It's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. I'll give you all of this if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. I, I see four things that are going on in this story that are powerful to me because I, they, they talk to where I live in the wilderness, the everyday kind of of trouble that you and I go through. Number one, beware of contrasts. Uh, chapter 3, verse 17. And then the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended on him, and there was a voice, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
Next verse. And then he was taken to the wilderness to be tempted. And isn't that one of the hardest things about life is how these things layer up and how they pull us back and forth and how we suffer whiplash in the process of our lives? Isn't that what wilderness really is? That it's not just that life is hard. You could almost get used to it if life was just hard, but it's not just hard. Sometimes it's going along okay, and then suddenly it takes an immediate left or an immediate right that we didn't see coming, and we struggle to process the contrasts that are going on in our lives. And I think Jesus is simply saying, listen, it's okay. Be aware that life is like that. It's okay. I don't know how you grew up or how you thought it was all going to go, but this is how I thought it was going to go. I thought you start out and life is wonderful and you just, you know, you have a wonderful childhood. I had a wonderful childhood, uh, you know. I mean, I was super anxious to grow up in some ways and still haven't grown up in other ways. Amen? But in my brain, as a kid, it was just wait till I get my driver's license. Just wait till I get out of high school. Just wait till I finish college. Because then, whoo, then it's all going to come together. It's going to be wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a wonderful, easy, happy. And, you know, I heard people say, well, you better be prepared for it. This is good. Not me, man. <laughs> I love God and God loves me. We're just going to sail through life. It'll be awesome. And then the contrasts come. And you don't ever really get over the hump, do you? Because <laughs> about the time, you know, you... You get your brain sort of straight, then your body falls apart. <laughs> Amen? Dan Marino used to say, when I came into the league, he's a football player, for those of you that don't know. He was a quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. He said, uh, when I started in the league, my body could do anything, but I didn't know what to do. At the end of my career, I knew exactly what to do, but my body would no longer do it. That sums up life, doesn't it? We start figuring things out. So beware of the contrast because that's a part of it. And when contrasts come, when, we're, when we have that whiplash that's pulling us back and forth in our hearts and our souls, we say, meanwhile, this is not the only story. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Our light and momentary troubles are creating for us a glory that far outweighs them all. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Meanwhile, God is doing work. He doesn't cause all the things that go on in our life. They're caused by all kinds of things. Sometimes crazy people. But in all things, he's working. And so when the contrasts threaten to pull us apart, we go, no, no. Meanwhile, listen, there's victory in the wilderness. That's the story. You will have trouble, but be of good cheer. Are we? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Are we? Or maybe we've started looking for shortcuts of how to, you know, shorten up the journey, hurry up our progress. Number two. Choose the right bread. I love this verse. After 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. <laughs> you think? I mean, I, I have a hard time going 40 minutes. So 40 days. That's serious stuff. And Satan comes to him and says, and, and if you've been in this part of the Judean wilderness, then you know that it's desert. It's a desert. But all over the desert, there's these little round rocks that poke their little heads up. So when you look out over the sand, there's all these little rocks. Turn these stones into bread. I can imagine if you're really hungry, looking out there and going, it looks like a nice loaf of bread right there. And Jesus says, it is written that we are to live on the bread of the word of God. I am so tempted when I am in hardship or difficulty or trials to eat a different kind of bread. I don't know what kind of bread you like to feast on, but I like a nice, thick slice of self-pity. That is my favorite <laughs> bread. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I just like to go, oh, this is so sad about what's happening to me. It's just, I just like to look in here. I like to, get, you know, just shut. Oh. 
or self-indulgent. Jesus, what he's being tempted with is use your spirituality to satisfy your personal need. And Jesus is saying, that's not how you live. That's not what it's about. I, I don't use my spiritual connection to God to feed just me. I, I, I want to live on the word of God. I'm not going for some instant fix. I'm going for this long-term life in which I am living out the word of God. I don't get stuck here. And here's what's so ironic. When I feed on this bread of self-pity, I get all closed down. And I get my head down and I get shut down. But when I feed on the bread of life, my head comes up. And my heart comes up. And I'm a part of a much bigger story. And I'm just a part of a great cloud of witnesses who have gone through stuff for generations. And God's been faithful. There's victory in the wilderness. But what kind of bread I'm eating when I'm in those tough spots has a lot to do with the joy with which I am processing. And I know someday there'll be a final victory and we can all just, you know, celebrate and that'll be great. And there'll be no more tears and crying and sorrow and death and no more separation. But I think God wants us to live in the victory now. I think that's a part of the celebration we're participating in. We're entering into Passion Week. I'm going to talk to you next week about the weirdest story in all of history because the end is in the middle. And God intends for us to live in victory, not sometimes, but on a daily basis because we have the maturity to say, meanwhile, count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of every kind. Number three. Everybody doing okay? Yeah. Glad everybody's here online with us. It's awesome. Next week, Easter is going to be so fun. Uh, I'm excited. Our first Easter celebration in person in two years. and So let's really celebrate. Let's just come with that. And, you know, I'll probably get a new, you know, I don't know, maybe. Nah, I won't. <laughs> Number three, keep your priorities straight. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and said, cast yourself off and they'll all see. So he says, he says, here's the temptation. Do something sensational. Do something sensational. And by the way, everybody knows, I think, but uh, Jesus wasn't the only person walking around uh, who had messianic sort of overtones at the time. Uh, you aware of that? That was a pretty common thing. There were always people showing up to claim to be messiahs. Uh, my favorite story is a, a, a man in the first century whose name was Simon Magnus. And uh, Simon Magnus uh, uh, told everyone he could fly, and he would fly to demonstrate that he was indeed the Messiah. And he did for a little while. <laughs> it turns out that was sort of the end of his messianic career <laughs> and also his life. But, uh, so there are these people around, and so Satan is really playing into the pattern. Why don't you go do something sensational, and when you do something sensational, then you'll get what you really want. And somewhere in here, we have to keep our priorities straight. I, I know that the temptation for me is to ask God to fix it all. I, I know that the temptation is to ask God to just, you know, with a bolt of lightning, some miracle, to fix whatever's broken. That, that just, you know, just fix it. Just in one big thing, take care of it. But my priority and the reality of what I'm taught in Scripture is that there's victory in the wilderness, but those shortcuts are not going to be really the way that we win. We win by perseverance, by keeping our priorities clear. We're not taking shortcuts. We're not looking for a way to avoid. We're looking for a way to thrive in the middle of whatever's happening around us. Because we know God is not wasting any of it. He's using it to grow us into complete and whole human beings. Number four, the end does not justify the means. Finally, he says, bow down to me, and then I will cause everyone to bow down to you. I will, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. Anybody see a problem with this process here? The first problem is it's not Satan's to give, which is so true in our lives. Just do this and you'll get what you want. Except that's not fulfillment. That's not where the answer lies. We, we don't get that out of shortcuts. We don't get victory out of messing up. But we feel like we do. 
We feel like I, I'm just going to go ahead and, and I'm going to indulge this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn my head. I'm going to look the other way. I'm going to, and, and in this process, then I'm going to get through. I'm going to take some shortcuts. I'm going to make some progress. But there really aren't any shortcuts. This is about putting one foot in front of the other. It's about walking forward. It's about the trust that God is with us and he's not going to waste a single moment. Don't you wish you could get wise and mature without going through that stuff? I, uh, my wife's grandfather was a, in World War II and wounded in World War II. And, and uh, you know, hearing him talk about his buddies and his friends and the things that happened to him and the story of what was going on in our country at the time. And, and I, I reflect on that. You know, we call it the golden generation. And what was it? I mean, there wasn't a home in America that wasn't impacted by the horror of what was happening in the world. There wasn't a home in America that wasn't impacted by the loss of loved ones. And yet out of that period of time comes these people of great depth and discipline and, and stamina and strength. And I think God desires that of us. I don't know if you've looked around, but we're going through stuff. The world is a mess. Sometimes frighteningly so. Meanwhile, count it pure joy when you go through trials of every kind. Because you know that the trying of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance, when it is finished, produces maturity and completeness. And I don't really care about perseverance all that much, but I do care about maturity and completeness. Because I think what God is saying is, I want to make you into a fully integrated human being. I want you to be healthy, and I want you to be whole. In a world where there's a lot of crazy people, I want to lead you into a place of depth and maturity, completeness, so that you're really good inside, so that your head and your heart and your body all work together the way they were designed to work. I, I want that to be for you. I want when you're quiet that your inner world is a safe place for you. I want that. And I want when you interact with other people that that's a safe place. That you're actually a light to the world and salt to the world. I, I want you to live in that kind of completeness and wholeness. I want you to be a great parent. I want you to be a great spouse. I want you to be a, a, a great friend. I want you to be a great employer. I want you to be a great employee. And I don't know how to grow you except to take you into space where I walk you through the process. And in that, there'll be things that happen in life. But listen, I'm going to be with you in that. I'm going to be with you in that. And I'm going to use it. I'm not going to waste one tear. I'm not going to waste one struggle. I'm not going to waste one ounce of your self-pity. I'm going to use all of it, all of it. And you don't have to believe this. You can live life in a different way. Because in this world, you will have trouble. So you're going to face it with the meanwhile in your heart. Meanwhile, God is going to use today. And somehow he's going to be rewiring me in this process. And he's going to be making me new. And I don't like it. And I wish life were a lot easier. But I either believe that all of this is random and meaningless. Or I believe that God is in the middle of it using whatever happens to me for good. That's, I think, what James is inviting us to. That kind of joy. But this isn't the end of the story. This is just the first wilderness that we have recorded for Jesus. There's another wilderness. And that happens over in Matthew's gospel in the 21st chapter. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, uh, and if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their, cloak, spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. I don't know if you ever put this together, but Jesus opens his ministry entering into the wilderness. And now this is the entry into the final piece of the wilderness. From the everyday sort of things that happen in life to now the life-altering kinds of events and grief. And I know we celebrate Palm Sunday and it has great energy and we should. We are entering into the celebration of the victory of Christ. We'll get quiet now because we're entering Holy Week. We'll, we'll calm ourselves a little and we'll walk the days of Holy Week. Jesus says he descends the Mount of Olives. And if you've ever been there and you've walked the path of the triumphant entry, halfway down the mountain there's a church kind of off to the side of the path. And that church commemorates the moment that Jesus steps aside and he looks over Jerusalem and he weeps. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had known what would bring you peace. But you would not listen. And it seems to me that Jesus is saying, listen, I've been through the everyday ups and downs and all the stuff that happens to us in the course of life. And there's things to remember as you're making that journey in the wilderness because it is common. And how we do it matters. And our attitude in it matters. That's what gives us victory in life, how we navigate. But this other part, this life-altering grief part, that's where Jesus is entering in now, this journey down into that wilderness. And you and I know how the story goes. We know what happens next. But the distinct difference between the everyday kind of wilderness And this life-altering grief kind of wilderness is powerful. This day-to-day wilderness grinds out. It grinds out. It takes patience. It takes perseverance. It takes hovering at 30,000 feet sometimes, getting out of your daily stuff, and just stepping back and saying, have I grown any? Am I any better? Am I any smarter? Am I any deeper? Am I any more mature? You know what I bet you'll find? You are. You're up. You're dressed. You're winning. (laughs) This other kind of grief, it's not a daily grind. It's a chasm of hurt. And Jesus walks this journey because even here there is victory in the wilderness. And we can hardly read the story without knowing what's on the other end because what's on the other end is nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not life, not death, not things present, not things to come, not powers, not principalities. And this victory in the wilderness should always make us look at these situations and be able to count it pure joy. Our destiny is set (laughs) We're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And God's not going to waste one bit of the struggle. Not one bit. He's going to use every bit of it to build something powerful in you. Perseverance. And perseverance, when it's finished, will bring about completeness and maturity so that you could be a fully integrated human being. You could count it pure joy because any day you say, meanwhile... I got up this morning. (sighs) Needed to take the dog out. Went to the back door. Unlocked the back door. The key broke off in the lock. I'm mad. You just, you can hardly, I just woke up. Isn't that the nature of it? You just hardly can do anything without something going wrong. But meanwhile, is that really the thing? It's not. God is working, and he won't waste one broken key and one broken lock. 
He's going to use it to create in me a better me. Because that's his promise. Meanwhile. And if you're going through life-altering grief, there is victory in the wilderness. 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 Meanwhile, he goes to prepare a place. And if he goes to prepare a place, he will come again and receive us that wherever he is, there we can be also. God, we give you thanks. We do believe that in the middle of whatever it is we're facing, whatever it is we're going through, that you intend for us to live lives of joy. Not the superficial kind of happy, jumping up and down, ignoring the realities of our lives, but a deep kind of wisdom that simply says, meanwhile. Meanwhile, I know God's working. Meanwhile, God's going to use this. Maybe we could even laugh out loud and say, wow. I'm going to get a lot of maturity out of this because we trust you. Would you help us when life gives us those crazy contrasts? Would you remind us to eat the right bread? Ask us, challenge us about what it is we're feeding our hearts and our minds on. We want to feed on your word and less on our own thoughts and our own journey. Lead us. Guide us. Remind us to keep our priorities clear. Remind us that the ends doesn't justify the means. Help us just take the next step to be faithful and to consider it pure joy because we do trust you. Lead us and guide us. Hear us as we respond to your word. We do believe you never let go. And for that, we are grateful. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, will you stand as we celebrate? I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will pray.